these words from the final part of the canticle to creation. Praise be you, Lord, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whom no living man can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are those whom death will find in your most holy will, for the second death shall not do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord, and give God thanks, and serve God with great humility. St. Francis, as he was dying, wrote that last verse and asked that his family, his community of monks, come and sing that to him. And so daily, while he was dying, they sang the canticle of creation to him. In those last days, he said, I have done what is mine to do. May Christ now teach you what you are to do. I've been thinking about Job a lot this week. In the last, very last words about Job in his book, it talks about the restoration of Job about how he is restored to all that was former. In fact, it, he's restored in such a way that he has doubled what he had before. And now normally, I would tell you that I can't stand this scripture. God doesn't do that. God doesn't give you a replacement family. So how do we deal with this scripture about Job whose life changes after the death of his family? I think it has important lessons to teach us this week as we think about how do you move forward in the face of overwhelming suffering and grief? Because that's Job's story, right? In the beginning of his story, he loses everything. He loses his family. He loses his children. He loses his farm, his animals, the people who worked for him. And he's sitting there in the garbage dump. Feeling that pain and sorrow and suffering. How do you move forward from that? How do you move forward when you've lost so much? So what does it mean to be restored? I think that's one of our first questions to ask, right? What does it mean to be restored? Because we know right now in the United States, since January, there have been over 200 mass shootings. That's a lot of pain that people are going through. A lot of grief and suffering. And how do you move forward in that? I mean, before this week, when we had the slaughter of children, we had the slaughter of grandparents. How do you move forward in that pain? How do you take the next right step to move you to a new place? That's why I think Job teaches us that lesson. Although not normally in the way that you've heard everybody else preach it. Because they told you, you get everything back and God's going to bless you forever. And it's going to be better than before. But what we learn is that Job had to make a choice. He had to decide whether he was going to stay there in that ash pit, in that grief, in that sorrow, in that pain. He had to decide whether he was going to get up and live again. And the people in Texas right now, they aren't anywhere near the point of where they can make that decision. Even the people in Buffalo aren't in that point. Because it's too raw and too painful. <clears throat> but what Job teaches us in this last section is that restoration comes from community. 
Because I don't know if you've heard it, because we get distracted by the names of his daughters, which are funny in English. Um, but in, in Hebrew, he calls one of them Dove. He calls one of them um, Rouge, as in on your cheeks. In order to showcase that these are beloved children. So beloved, in fact, that he changes the rules of society for those kids. That for those three girls, he says that they will inherit equally what their brothers have. That was not done. That was not allowed. And yet he changed society for the love of those children. But how did he get to that step? He got to that step of restoration through community. Because what it says between Joe praying for his friends and everything coming back to him is that his brothers and sisters and those that he knew brought to him a piece of gold and a piece of jewelry. I like to think it's a little bit about the loaves and fishes, right? Job had nothing. He was in an ash heap, okay? And one by one, a family member came and gave him what little they had, a piece of gold, a piece of jewelry. And pretty soon, Job had enough gold that he could buy that first oxen, that first goat, that first donkey. And then those first animals led to the second and the third until he had a herd of each. That that little bit of gold, that little bit of jewelry helped, helped him to get back to life. It showed him that people cared, that they were concerned about who he was, that they wanted him to be able to move forward. And so they gave what little bit they had. And that little bit helped Job to eventually move to life. Because you know it didn't happen overnight. Because you can't have ten children in, you know, overnight. It just isn't possible. But at some point, Job and his wife made the decision to live again. They chose to believe that even with that overwhelming grief and suffering, even knowing that the world could be a place of trauma, that they were going to have new life. That they were going to have babies, even though it was hard. They were going to have babies to show that they could go on living. But Job has been changed by this experience. Changed by the way community has surrounded him. Changed by the way God has interacted with him. And so with those children, he's a different person than he was with the first. With those first children, when they would go and have a party, he would pray to God that they didn't do anything that God would not forgive them for, okay, right? He always said a prayer for them and made sacrifices for whatever it was they were doing in that house. Now, he experiences the world differently. He sees those, the beauty in those daughters that he now has. He experiences the joy of that family because the pain and sorrow and suffering while always present. And I know you know how it's always present. When I moved in with my grandmother, who was in her 70s when I was in my 20s, the story that she spoke all the time was of her oldest son, who was killed too young. That pain was always there, even as she was celebrating a crop of great-grandchildren that were appearing over and over again. Because those grandchildren brought her life and hope 
but she never forgot the pain of her oldest son being gone. And Job and his wife didn't forget the pain. But they learned that that God who came out of the whirlwind and spoke of mystery and hope and joy and the creative ability of the earth to thrive, that God of mystery and hope was there all along in all of those places that we didn't normally think God would be. That the God of hope was present, surrounding them. And so with those new children, those children that they chose even in the face of suffering, Job experienced their presence differently. Job saw them as treasures and saw each one of them as precious. That's why that line about inheritance is so important. Because it shows us that they were no longer a collective, because in the collective, the oldest son got everything. In the new community, everyone experienced, everyone experienced the wealth of the family. This week, one of the newsletters that I get every week is from Valerie Carr. And I don't know if you've heard of her. You probably have because she spoke at General Synod last summer. And the, the conference council is reading her book right now. But Valerie Carr is a Sikh woman who has been talking about peace and community for a very long time. And in the newsletter she sent me this week, she talks about her experience. Because she was Sikh and a person who dealt with issues of trauma and overcoming them and creating community out of the tragedy, she was called to Milwaukee after the Sikh community was attacked by a hate-filled man. And they, he walked into their temple their worship space and killed some of them. And she was there to help them move through the grief of that. And she didn't know how they would move through it. She didn't know if it was possible. And yet, that the first funerals that they held, thousands upon thousands of Milwaukeeans started to show up started to say, you're part of us. That we will work with you and organize with you to change so this does not happen again. And out of that tragedy and the organizing that they did, they helped to change and strengthen the hate crimes laws. But here's the thing. The day she left Milwaukee and went back to Connecticut, when she landed and opened up her phone, it exploded with messages. Because it happened to be the day that Sandy Hook occurred. And after she had experienced the community coming together in grief over her people, she went to the church there. She went to the church there and grieved with that community. Showing them that they were not alone that there were others that were part of them. And then she came to this week. Because she talks about creating beloved community, creating communities of love, choosing to love even in the face of suffering, even in the face of discrimination. She was invited to go to Buffalo into a church to speak. And just before she was speaking in Buffalo, she learned the news about Texas. And she says in that newsletter, we have options. There are things that we can do. And you all know the first thing we can do, right? We need to figure out how to deal with guns. It doesn't matter if you have guns at home. We need to figure 
figure out how to deal with the problem of guns so that they aren't allowed to mow down children. Children should be safe. They are precious. And so whatever it takes, we have to make sure that that changes. And then she says, here are the things I want you to work on. If you are grieving, I want you to cry all those tears. I want you to take the time to feel that pain and sorrow, to acknowledge that this death reminds you of another death. I want you to feel and experience that grief. And if you are feeling the grief, I want you to be the community that surrounds those who are grieving. And she says, and if you are feeling anger or rage, it's okay to experience that anger and rage. Scream, yell. And then she says you have to get active. You have to channel that grief and that rage and figure out how with the people near you, you can create community that doesn't allow that. That you can be with those who are suffering. That you can learn who your neighbors are, who the people are around you, so that you can make connections, so that you are there for them in those moments of sorrow and tragedy and grief and pain, that you are present with them. And that's the job of our church, right? That's our job, to be that place, to be the presence that allows people to grieve, to rage, to comfort, and to show that there's a way forward a way forward that is different. And that's what Job's story teaches us, right? That we can move forward from the suffering and grief. We will be changed and different. But we can move forward. We can change what happened. Or as Frank, St. Francis said, I have done what is mine to do. May Christ now teach you what you are to do. Amen.